instructors that are in university, college, when they're thinking about getting into the music industry, they go, well, oh, I gotta check advance. I gotta get over here. I gotta make sure that I, I, I speak with my peers and also those who could possibly be my mentors. Uh, I would love that to be the norm. I think that that is an important aspect that truly does assist with the growth of our industry. To the beginning of what? To be me? I don't know, shout out mom, I guess. <laughs> um, but what drove me to get into the music business? Uh, I always saw a need that artists needed someone to represent them that also understood and had more of a connection with them. I think a lot of the time when you look at managers or when you look at the industry, a lot of people are very corporate or they just have no backing, right? So they, they, they end up in this space where it's a bit confusing for the artists. They're like, okay, well, who has my back here? Like who in the room is the person that actually represents me? And when I started, I actually first started with electronic music and electronic DJs. And a lot of the DJs that I, were, I was speaking with at the time, they didn't have the business acumen. They understood uh, what they wanted to do. And at the time especially, electronic music wasn't as popular. So you had, you had a few, you like had a handful that were touring, but they weren't making that much. And when it came down to it, I was the individual that kept saying, hey, look, we could do this tour in Europe, or we could go uh, to these venues, or here's another way that we can market your music. And for me, that was what made me realize I could actually do this. There's something here. And at first, it wasn't about money. It wasn't about getting the recognition, it was more about, like I said, representing that artist, representing them in those other rooms because they couldn't speak for themselves. And um, the first company that I started was called Faceless Management for that reason. Um, it was not about me, it was about them, right? Uh, what got me to this point though from there, at first it, for a long time, I didn't think that it would actually work. Uh, I thought that I'd probably have to figure something else out. I dabbled in uh, getting to law and doing law school. But what made me stick with it was that relationship that I had with the clients. They just felt like there was a friendship, but then beyond that, almost like being a father. And you don't want to abandon your kids. So a lot of the time... For me, that was, the, that was the thought process. It was, you know, I don't want to abandon them. I want to actually like guide and build. And uh, yeah, that's kind of how I started in a jumbled way. Like I said, I was even saying this before. It's hard for managers, and, and I'm sure you'll hear that a lot when you speak with a lot of them. It's hard for a manager to remember their own history. But if you ask me, tell me about this client, tell me about this artist, tell me about this tour, tell me about that, it's easy. Right? We, we spend so much of our time living for someone else that sometimes we forget our own history and our own life. So apologize to anybody listening to this if they're like, uh, what about you? What about you? No, 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 no. I love talking about the clients. It's, it's what I live for. It's what I breathe for. A shy guy. He, he doesn't really like to talk. He doesn't like to do a lot. So I needed to kind of step in front and really be that person for him. And that was the experience that I realized, yeah, you are needed. You're important. He's got to do the important stuff as far as the music. But it is just as vital to have that person in the room to really make sure that you can direct and divert even at some moments. And for me, that was the experience that I realized the role that I needed to fit um, on that scale. There's other places and ways that you can also be effective as a manager. Uh, but that was my first experience of realizing, yeah, hmm, okay, you're important, you're needed. I 
I still have the backup plan. At some point, Taylor will ball. Like, look out for me, guys. I'm probably going to take your clients. But, I mean, that's a whole other thing. Uh, but when did I throw out that original plan? Maybe five years ago. Like, it was recent. And it was having that confidence in a partner. Uh, my business partner, Awesome, who's been in the industry for 20 plus years, having someone that you can bounce those ideas off of, having someone that actually puts the battery in your backpack, I think that's what allows you to go, you know what, I don't need a backup because I have a backup. I have someone that like actually strongly believes in what I'm doing so that it helps me to step out in faith and, and, and to make things happen. And then, of course, having great clients, having great individuals that you work with on a daily basis that really just helps um, register what this is and, and how you really fit in. <laughs> Too many. Too many. Um, even in the Canadian music industry, it was, it was difficult at first. Uh, I think a lot of the time, especially for uh, the black individuals in our space because we don't either a feel like we have someone to lean on or someone to re refer to a lot of the time we spend our times either a burning ourselves in, and, I'm, and i'm speaking more about the entrepreneurs i don't really know how the experience is for labels but as an entrepreneur we end up kind of cocooning we protect ourselves we don't want to um assimilate Right? So then we, we, we keep ourselves in spaces. Like, for example, when I was working in electronic music solely, I could count on, like, one hand the amount of other black individuals, not even just managers, but individuals in that space. And we didn't communicate on a regular basis. We didn't even try and collaborate because it was, this is where I am, this is where you are, good luck. And I think that that is the reason why, in my opinion, a lot of doors can be closed on someone. Because a lot of the time you either break a door or somebody opens it for you. And that is what we're kind of trying to create with Vance, with um, other collectives that are growing up and bubbling right now. You're seeing a lot more people just coming together, you know, communicating, hey, what are you doing? How did you find that? That didn't exist a few years ago. And I think that's a beautiful thing. So to answer that question in terms of um, the doors closing, tons happened, but it was my fault. And I realized that. And that's something that I think that we all need to realize and communicate with each other so that that next generation doesn't have that problem. Hmm. Yeah, I know. That's why I'm going to like, damn. So much about me. Uh, where did I find the strength? I'm a huge history buff. Um, I can relate to a lot of historical figures, um, especially those in the music industry. So I love biographies, documentaries, things like that where my strength came from was that was, it happened to somebody else and they got through it, so you can too. And so a lot of the times I would refer to, you know, those giants and the individuals I believed in and, and um, I would refer to their, their histories and their stories and, and that's how I got through. Imposter syndrome happens to everyone, uh, especially managers, because a lot of the time we're thinking why am I, like, why do you care? Why am I the individual that is in the middle of all of this? And do I actually have a place? So yeah, you, you feel it. You, you definitely get that feeling a lot. Uh, how I got over that is realizing, again, the importance of that space, of being that middleman. Being a good middleman, I think, is, uh, is, is rule number one for any manager that's starting off. Be a great middleman. Know your place in that too. 
know that that individual isn't talking to you without that client and that client can't get it done without you. But realize that that's the place. A lot of managers sometimes think and step away from being a middleman and try to be the person or step back and think that they don't have importance. So that is probably how I fought back on like imposter syndrome is realizing exactly where I need to be and staying there rather than trying to be something else. What did I tell myself? Again, that's it's it usually just came down to um, having that discussion about, hey, there's other individuals have gone through this before. You can do it. And having that confidence um, is something that has, has definitely and truly helped me before. I'm sorry. People need to stop calling. I'm fine. I'm alive. I'm good. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, from a very early age, my parents always fostered that whatever you put your mind to, with God's help, you can do it. You can, you can make it happen. And they're very, very spiritual and rooted in that, so that helped a great deal. And then there's been teachers and coaches and, like, sports and whatnot that have always kind of ushered me along and just continued to push, like, hey, you can do this self-confidence aspect. And then again, my, my business partner now at this point, uh, he's definitely been a great source just as far as this business is concerned. And I've had the pleasure of having really great mentors that have you know, gone on to do amazing things that I can call on at any point, have those conversations. Some of them are even brand new around like the last two years. Uh, I think that speaks to my business acumen and them realizing or seeing something in me and I'm honored for that. And I continue to pay that forward by being that mentor and that individual to young managers and individuals in this business. They found me, a lot of them found me. And I think that's what happens with mentorship. I think those who go seeking for something, sometimes um, they're, they're barking up the wrong tree <clears throat> and maybe they're asking from someone that probably doesn't want to be asked. Uh, but they all found me, um, be it someone saying, you need to speak to him, you need to help this person, and I'm really honored for that. I'm, I'm really grateful that someone or people see something like that in me. That I'd like to learn from? I'd l huh? Oh, yeah, I wasn't going to. I, I've, if you haven't noticed, I'm, I try to keep names out of things. I don't know why. I don't know. That's, it's a sixth sense. Uh, I'd love to learn from individuals in tech. I think that there's not enough black tech innovators or individuals, and I'd love to learn so that I can share. Everything that I learn, if there's one thing that to get to know or anything about me is anything I know, I'm knowing it so I can share it with either my clients, uh, friends, family, people that are in my circle. I want to figure things out and then be like, hey, I just learned this, check this out, go here, try this person. Like, to me, that's the most important thing. And yeah, I'd, I'd love to learn more about what's happening in the tech space so that I can foster that with some of my clients. One of the biggest things uh, that I talk about with our clients is that we're not going to stay here. I tell every one of them when we're doing uh, meetings, we're not staying in the music space. This is where you start. But we'll move on and do great things. And the only way we can do that is by learning. So if I can learn something interesting about tech, I'll bring that to DJSB, for example. I'll bring that to Dylan Sinclair and be like, hey, guys, like this is important. You should check this out. So, yeah, I'd love to learn more about tech, figure that out, and, and disperse that amongst the people that I care about. Uh, 
uh, no one teaches you that the no's do turn into yeses. You have to figure that out on your own. And I think a lot of the time, especially one thing that we don't want to admit to ourselves as black people is that we are proud people. We are extremely proud people. And sometimes that gets in front of us. So when we hear no's, we go, well, you know what? Psh, forget that. I'm not doing that anymore. That person doesn't like me or this person doesn't get me or whatever. And we write them off. That's not necessarily the case. I think a lot of the time it starts as a no. It's our job to be a proof of concept. And that's fine. I have no problem doing that. If we believe in ourselves or we believe in what we're doing or what we're trying to accomplish, that no will become a yes. And I think once that happens and once you experience that, every situation becomes the same thing. Anytime I'm speaking to someone and I'm like, oh, you don't get it yet? No problem. I'll see you in a year. I'll see you in six months. That'll be a yes. And that's what I had to learn through experience. Not every client is for me. A lot of the time, you feel like you have to, as a manager, you have to be everyone's manager. You want to save the world, so to speak. But there are some clients that maybe that's not a fit. And it has nothing to do with you as the manager. It has nothing to do with the client. Just sometimes it's not a good fit, just like a relationship. So sometimes... Understanding that is a tough, tough pill to swallow. And yeah, there's definitely those moments where I've had to come to grips with that. Uh, they all end in different ways. Um, some of them, it's a full on conversation. Hey, this is not a good fit. Some of them just disperse you just stop having that connection that communication um but how do i get or come to terms with it it's usually a conversation that i have with myself where i realize okay what's not working where's your energy being placed and where do i need to go from here and it takes sometimes a week sometimes a couple weeks but once I get to that conclusion, it's uh, time to move on. Time to get, because the other thing too you gotta think about is that there are clients that you still have that need your help, that need your guidance. And spending your time dwelling on why that doesn't work is not suitable for them. So you wanna be able to move on as quickly as possible. Tons, tons. I wish I started this sooner. I wish I figured out what I wanted to do uh, as a manager. I think a lot of the time, I look at a manager similar to a lawyer, and maybe that's just because I know both of those worlds, but great managers understand where they specialize. Like, what do you bring to the table Yes, you have to look at a lot of areas and as aspects, but every manager has one specialty that that's what they jump into. Some of them are marketing geniuses. Some of them are great accountants. Some of them have a backing in law. Some of them can um, put on a show, like they can literally put the show together themselves. I had to figure out that mine was business development. I'm all about building a brand around clients and then going out and literally making that my goal. Talking to individuals and making them believe that this brand is bigger than what they're seeing today. I didn't realize that until, I don't know, maybe three years ago, three, four, because for the longest time I thought it was just, okay, get on the road, you know, make sure the client gets paid, have fun, party, whatever. But that's not what my specialty was. And figuring that out has made me more comfortable in my business and has made clients much happier because they know, oh, this is what we're going to do. And now that I've gotten into that rotation, it's made, uh, it's made things a lot better.
Uh, what was going on in my life five years ago? And I keep saying five, but it's probably longer. It's just that pandemic two years literally is just a, it's a blip on the radar and almost like everything was lost in that period. But at that point, um, I was in a transition phase between one company and another company. So I was moving from my first uh, business partner that I had with the next business partner that I wanted to have. And in that moment, I started thinking about, okay, what, again, the, that same thing that I'm talking about, some things are just not a fit. So I was thinking, what didn't work? What was I spending too much time doing? And what needs to change so that I don't repeat the same thing? Even thinking about it right now, a little choked up because I had zero clue. And for the first time in my life, I doubted myself. Like I was saying, confidence has always been something. That was that one period where I went, are you sure? Is this really what you want to do? Because you haven't figured this out yet. What's wrong? And I don't know how. Definitely friends. Definitely family, but I made it through. And that was that change for me. It was the right clients that came into my life. It was the right business partner that came into my life. And realizing how I played a role within both of their spaces, I think that's what really set things off for me. Right. I didn't at one point. Uh, I didn't think about that importance. That was actually something that I learned after um, getting back on track. I realized that I was in a really dark place before that and I needed to figure out something or a tool to help me counter that if it should ever arise again. And so I started working out and I started running. Uh, kind of funny that I started running. <laughs> but yeah, I, I started doing long distance running. Um, I used to do that in, in school uh, when I was growing up. So I got back into that, started running half marathons, marathons, things like that, just to something to just escape everything, escape what was in my present. And that's kind of why I was saying it's funny that I was running. I, I just realized that the joke was <laughs> mentally and not into this room. But um, it's funny that I chose running because I needed to escape. And when I, usually when I do a run, I start, I have a starting point, I just go. I don't time myself. I don't um, say, oh, we have to do this today. It's literally just, okay, let's go. But the important part is to get back to where I started. So whenever I finish, it's almost like, all right, this is over. This is done. Get back to work. And that's become a great source for me. And that's been the way that I've kind of had that self-care. Switching cameras, taking a break? Let's take a break. How are we doing so far? Am I boring? I would, I'm gonna have some water, actually. Where did it go? You stole my water? Damn it. Knees. I can't believe y'all had me sell my knees out. Thank you so much. Yeah, sorry if I'm, if I'm boring, you guys. I feel bored. You know what it is? Yeah, I know exactly what it is. It's like, geez. No? Do I need it? Are you telling me I need it? Mm. No, no, no. 
as long as I don't need it. Yeah. Come on, come on, people. Yeah, come on, people. It's the blackness in us. Come on. How we, we need makeup? What? No, I'm good. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Definitely needed a little water. You can hear my voice cracking. <clears throat> Fun part. When did I start making bank? I don't know. <laughs> What's the definition of making bank in this business? The backup plan wasn't because of a lack of funds. Um, I think it was just a lack of purpose. I don't think I've ever really had a moment where I was thinking that music couldn't make money. And I've been blessed that even throughout transitions or whatever, I've always had some form of a steady income. I would say the moment when I realized that I was making bank is probably with, uh, with Cyril, with when we were going international and going to Bali or going to Australia or in, you know, being able to be comfortable. Um, that was, that was a really interesting feeling and being able to, I think for me, making bank or that definition isn't about me. It's actually about, again, you're going to hear a lot of that with anything that I talk about when it comes to the clients. It's about the clients. If they can pay their bills, if they can buy a house, cars, whatever, that's my definition of me making bank. Because let's also not forget, you're only making 10 to 20% of their gross income. So if I'm living okay, damn, they're living great. So for me, that's the, uh, sorry, that's the, uh, that light bulb with that good feeling. Absolutely, it's client. It's a client being able to uh, propose to their fiance. It's a client buying a house, having a child, being able to support their life outside of music. That to me is everything. That to me is success. And I'm privileged now to have a crop of like younger artists and seeing them enter into their 20s, which is wild. Like the fact that there are some clients that I have that have just turned 21 or 22 and knowing that I want to be the best version of myself for them so that I can teach them, hey, this is how you can walk through life. Because we all need that. Um, I read a quote a few years ago and it was, be the version of yourself that your younger version would have wanted to meet. And I actually get a chance to have the younger versions of myself on a day-to-day -day basis. So I get to have that relationship with that younger self. And so I try to make sure that um, my success is really built off the back of seeing them grow into great men and women. And uh, that's, that's everything to me. Mm-hmm. Get advice from my younger self or give advice? Wow. That's a very interesting question. Um, I'd probably ask him, like, why are you so confident? Why are you so damn confident? Like, you don't know anything. You aren't, you haven't done anything. How are you so sure? of yourself and where does that come from? The confidence that I have today is nowhere even close to what it was at that point. So I'd probably ask him that. Like, because I think youth has a degree of confidence that will never be um, 
challenged and it will never be duplicated. And I think it's because, I mean, for example, take a toddler. You know, you, they'll get up and just start walking. And they don't know where they're going. They're just walking because that's what they want to do. They have that courage to just try. As we age, we start thinking of that next move and we start thinking of all the reasons why it won't work. I would love to see that younger version of myself continue to be that courageous and take a page out of their book. So I would want to ask them, how do you do it? Where do you find that strength? And can I have some of it? I don't. I listen to it sometimes. I definitely listen to it. I think it's, it's, while it's great to have that confidence and that courage, there's a mode that we're all going through as we age, and there's, uh, people call it sage mode, and that's important. I think knowing your limitations, knowing your limitations allows you to look for others to support you. When people are confident, when people are cocky, they go out it alone. When you are wise, you find other people to do things with you. And I feel like that voice is that voice that constantly reminds me, you can't do this by yourself. You need someone else. Ask your peers, ask your friends. And that's so important and yet so lacking in our, uh, in our community at times. But we're getting there, we're getting better. I surround myself with younger people. I think, again, drawing from history, um, a lot of the time we look at a Clive Davis or Dave Morris or individuals like that and we're like, Oh, this old white guy is still in the industry. How's he doing it? Well, it's because they surrounded themselves with younger people. Jimmy Iovine surrounded himself with younger people. He understood that, you know, the example that I always use is with Clive Davis. He, he knew that there was something special in a Diddy and a bad boy, which kept him relevant through a period that he didn't understand the music. He didn't understand the genre, but he understood that there are individuals who know and that's back to that limitation of being at that sage mode in life. So I understand that, yes, while I might be able to tell you about a great artist or a great sound, I'm not hearing everything. There are individuals that we surround ourselves with at our company that are as young as 18, that are sending us music or ideas or artists. That's how I try to stay relevant, is listen to them. affected my, sorry, I got my career. Again, I probably black out a lot of it because that's just how I move on from things. I don't try to dwell. But there have been instances where, for example, being relegated or people thinking that all we could do is hip hop and R&B. Um, I completely am a fan of like what Chris Smith does in the sense of, oh, you don't think I can do pop music? Oh, you don't think I could do country? One minute, proof of concept. And I think that's really the, uh, the broad moment of racial unrest or racial situations in our industry is that there's always that limit. Oh, you should meet this artist. Why? Because he makes hip hop? Cool, that's fine, and I get it. But you can also introduce me to a country artist. I can definitely take on a classical music artist. And, and trust me, we have some really interesting new artists that are coming through that people are going to be shocked that we work with. And that's what I want. That shock, part of that actually comes from the fact that people put you in a box. We put ourselves in a box too at times. Oh, you did that? Oh, you work with that? Yeah, that's that box. That's that shock aspect and factor. 
And if every time you can do that, you're actually showing people their true colors. Where do you limit me? Where do you limit us? And maybe that changes over time. I don't know. But that would probably be um, an example of it in our industry. Again, shock and awe. It's all about proof of concept and shock and awe, making sure that I don't limit myself in that sense, that I'm constantly working to prove those and, pro and doing those proof of concepts as much as I can. I don't know everything. That's probably something that I need to constantly remind myself. Um, yeah, I've learned that. I've learned that we have such a great, talented group of entrepreneurs in our country, especially black entrepreneurs. And they just need a chance. They just need somebody to listen to them. And I found myself to be a great listener. That's something that I'm trying to do more of and present more, that I'm here to listen. Now, trust me, I don't want to listen to everybody or else I won't get anything done. But I think especially as entrepreneurs, we need that. We need to know that there's someone there to listen, up here to speak to. And... I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be that when need be. What's next? I have breakfast. <laughs> um, what's next in my career? Uh, just more proof of concept. Just continuing to uplift the artists that we have, the roster that we have. I think immediately, immediately it's, I call them like the three Ds, which is funny. It's uh, Dom Valley, it's DJSB, it's Dylan Sinclair, because those three especially um, have interesting and intricate stories to tell and I want to make sure that they are at the highest level to tell that story. So even, for example, just yesterday, Dom got a chance to play uh, Rolling Loud. He's just turning 22. And for him, the amount of work that he's done even before that, to get to this point, to be able to tell his story on this level, to have his mom and his dad there, that's proof of concept. Because a lot of the time, in, especially in creative industries, our parents are thinking of security. Oh, well, is my son going to be okay? Is my daughter going to be okay? Can you make rent? Can you? They, they see that struggle. So for them to witness that he's able to tell his story on this level, that's beautiful. So now i got to continue to do that as he continues to grow. So that's what's next for me, is making sure that each client has the ability to tell their story at the highest level. Mm -hmm. Family. Family, friends, business partner. My niece and nephew, especially. I look at them and... Um, Actually, to rewind, 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 the question that you had asked about what was that one thing that really changed for me, it was the birth of my niece. I realized that I wanted to be better for her. And I have something I look at all the time. I wrote down the day that she was born, I promise for Nia. And that's my promise, that I will be better and her brother Caleb came a few years after, but the first aspect of that for me was I promised for her, and I promised for him too. So what lifts me up is constantly remembering that promise that I've made 
to them, the promise that I make to my family, the promise I make to my clients. I will be better. I will do better so that we can be better. God damn, perfect. You good? Well, that was fun. Bore me for what? <laughs> See, that's, that's never a question that people ask, huh? Bore me for what? Uh, okay, sure.